Hello, I'm Barry Kern, CEO of Kern Studios and Mardi Gras World. For over 90 years, my family's been bringing Mardi Gras to the world. We're proud to sponsor the Historic New Orleans Collection's new exhibition, Making Mardi Gras. This exhibition and programs celebrate the artists and makers who make Mardi Gras so spectacular. Enjoy the program and happy Mardi Gras. Hey everyone, I'm Amanda McFillin here at the Historic New Orleans Collection. I just want to thank y'all all for tuning in for all of our presentations for this year's Williams Research Center History Symposium on Making Mardi Gras. Right now we have some bonus content for you. After hearing our panel discussion on carnival balls, we had more questions for historian Frank Perez and we were delighted when he offered to record this extended presentation on the history of gay carnival here in New Orleans. We hope you enjoy this presentation and thanks for tuning in. Happy Mardi Gras. Hello, I'm Frank Perez and I wanna thank you for joining me today as we talk a little bit about the origins of gay carnival in New Orleans. It's a, it's a fascinating topic that doesn't get enough attention. So I appreciate the Historic New Orleans Collection sponsoring this event. Thank you for, uh, for joining me. Um, I suppose the, First thing I should tell you about Gay Carnival in New Orleans is that the very first written reference to Mardi Gras in the, in the history of New Orleans uh, has to do with a drag performance. And right uh, here we have a quote from a book that was published uh, by the uh, Historic New Orleans Collection some years ago called A Company Man, which is basically a translation of the travel log of an employee of the Company of the West, who was here in the very earliest uh, years of the colony. He's writing this in 1729. He says, the next day, which was Lundy Gras, I went to the office where I found my companions bored to death. I proposed to them that we mask and go to Bayou St. John. As for myself, I was dressed as a shepherdess, all in white. I had a corset of white basin, a muslin skirt, a large pannier. I had some beauty marks too. I had my husband who was the Marquis of Carnival. What made it hard for people to recognize me was that along with having shaved very closely that evening, I had a number of beauty marks on my face and even on my breasts, which I had plumped up. Unless you looked at me very closely, you could not tell that I was a boy. And that was Mark Antoine Caillot talking about doing drag uh, in 1729 for Carnival. And so drag and Carnival has a long history. Uh, gay Carnival, as we understand that term today, uh, did not come about until much later. Um, and that dates back to the mid 20th century. And here you can see on the screen a uh, a brochure from 2013 uh, denoting the 64th annual Fat Monday Luncheon, which had uh, began in 1949. This was the first gay carnival, uh, I wouldn't call it an organization, but event that, uh, that we know of. It was begun by a gentleman named Bob Demons in 1949, who had some friends in for Mardi Gras uh, and wanted to take them to lunch on Lundy Gras. And that tradition continues uh, to this day. So the Fat Monday Luncheon is the oldest gay carnival event uh, in, the, in the city. Um, many of the members who uh, attended the Fat Monday Luncheon, uh, and it grew exponentially each year, eventually joined what came to be known as the Steamboat Club, which was organized in 1953. Not necessarily a carnival group, but uh, the oldest gay organization uh, in the city. And they, uh, they, they are still around as well. You can see the invite from 1986 there. Um, the first traditional crew, gay carnival crew, would be the crew of Yuga. And this originated in 1958, grew out of a house party. 
Uh, there's a fellow by the name of Doug Jones who lived on South Carrollton, right on the Carrollton Parade route. And each year, he would invite several of his gay friends over to watch the parade. And in 1958, they decided to uh, take it up a notch, so to speak. They had a costume party, which basically meant everybody came in drag. Uh, they named a queen, the Ruga, the Yuga Regina. Um, instead of debutantes, they had debut tramps. And it was just a, a fun way for Doug Jones and his friends to make fun of the seriousness with which traditional mainstream crews took themselves. You also have the initials KY, crew of Yuga. Yuga, by the way, is taken from Hindu mythology. It's, a, it's an epoch of time in Hindu mythology. But uh, the, the initials KY indicate uh, something of a coded signal. Uh, in the 1950s, there were not a lot of personal lubricants, which is a, kind of an important thing in gay male culture. Uh, and so it's hints at the satirical nature. Uh, the, the name Yuga, it probably comes from the 1889 Proteus Parade, uh, Hindu Heavens. Jones's family had ties to that parade and had, was a carnival enthusiast his, uh, his entire life. He was also a member of the Steamboat Club. Now, on Mardi Gras Day, ground zero for the gay community, at least in the French Quarter, was Dixie's Bar of Music. Uh, some of you may remember that bar. If you are of a certain age, it is uh, located at the corner of Bourbon and St. Peter Streets. Uh, currently, it is the Cat's Meow Karaoke Bar. But from 1949 to 1964, it was Dixie's Bar of Music, which was a de facto gay bar. Miss Dixie herself who passed away in 2011 at the age of 100 with gay nexus. Across the street, you had the Bourbon House, which was very gay and lesbian friendly. The Quarterites, uh, not far away, you had the Bachelor Bar at uh, Pat O'Brien's, which was a de facto gay bar as well. Uh, today, when we think of uh, the gay part of the quarter, we probably think of Bourbon and St. Anne, but that center of gravity has shifted over the decades. Uh, but in the 1950s, it would have been the corner of Bourbon and St. Peter. And so Doug Jones and his friends and other uh, gay men would have certainly been there on Mardi Gras Day each year. Now, the crew of Yuga met, uh, had its first two parties or balls in Doug Jones's home on Carrollton Avenue. By the third year, uh, they had grown so popular that they needed a larger meeting space. And uh, they eventually met at... Uh, a jazz club on Lake Pontchartrain. It was a pretty wild party, so they didn't go there uh, the following year. One of the members worked at an elementary school in uh, Metairie, and there was a dance recital hall called the Rambler Room attached to it. So in 1961, the crew of Yuga had their fourth ball at the Rambler Room, which went very well, and they decided to do it again the following year. So their fifth ball uh, in 1962, was also at the Ramble Room, but it was um, it was raided by the police. It was an ill-fated ball. And if you look at the invitation that you see here, this is a uh, a hand-drawn invitation to the crew of Yuga's bow mask on February 24th, 1962. This gives you a little insight into the artistry of gay carnival, uh, and that's one of the values of uh, the gay carnival phenomenon was it provided the gay community a creative and artistic outlet for their talents, whether it was set design, costume design, invitations such as this, or what have you. If you notice the name on the invitation, Mr. Tracy Hendricks is a, is a pretty important name that we'll see again. Um, so why was the fifth Yuga Ball rated? It's easy to assume that the very conservative suburban housewives of Metairie were alarmed when they saw a bunch of drag queens and sissies and uh, sodomites entering into this dance recital hall at the elementary school. And so a lot of people think that they call the police, but there's a, a much more interesting theory uh, that Doug Jones actually believed and other members uh, from that time related their theory that um, the raid was actually caused by a jilted drag queen who had been thrown out of the club named Candy Lee. And Candy Lee uh, was a very loud person who uh, 
was kind of annoying and had managed to have herself thrown out of the crew and became very angry. Uh, when the police showed up, they uh, arrested over 95 men, not quite 100. Um, people were jumping out of windows, fleeing for the swamp in the woods. Uh, there's uh, uh, police records indicate that it was about 97 or so men that were arrested. When word got back to the quarter uh, of the raid, uh, Miss Dixie of Dixie's Bar Music dispatched her attorney with a uh, load of cash from her safe and bailed everybody out of jail. And um, to get back to Candy Lee, Candy Lee worked at a bar called Tony Bacino's, which was at the corner of Bourbon Street and Toulouse. And in the 1950s, times were a lot different than they are now. Uh, today, New Orleans is very tolerant of the LGBTQ community, but not so much in the 1950s. Uh, as tourism was coming into its own as an industry, uh, the city, uh, the establishment, felt that queer visibility would scare away tourist dollars. And so the attitude of the city was, keep it on the down low, uh, don't be so obvious, we know you're in the quarter, but just keep yourselves in check. And uh, Mayor Morrison, Chuck Morrison, actually appointed a committee on the problem of sex deviance, whose sole purpose was to rid the French Quarter of homosexuals. Uh, that didn't work, but they tried really, really hard. And one of the ways they persecuted the gay community was to go after gay bars. Uh, Tony Bacino's was one of those bars. In 1958, this bar was raided uh, six or seven times within a matter of a few months. Candy Lee was one of the bartenders who was arrested, along with the manager, Roy Maggio, and a few others. They actually brought a civil lawsuit against the police, which was ultimately unsuccessful. But it was the first uh, legal action ever taken on behalf of LGBT rights uh, in New Orleans. But it was, uh, it was very common for the police to raid bars in the 1950s, and that lasted well through uh, the 70s, early 80s. So after the Yuga raid, uh, these two um, people that you see in this picture, here is Elmo Ave in the black and white photo. He is the one on the right standing dressed as uh, the Marquis de Vaudreuil, who was a French colonial governor in the mid 18th century. Uh, he owned an antique store that you see pictured here on Royal Street. He was at the, uh, the raided ball along with the gentleman on the right. William Woolley, or Bill Woolley, as he is more commonly known. Uh, and the next morning, after the raid, they met at the Bourbon House across from Dixie's and tried to figure out you know, what to do. And the end result was Yuga was done with. Um, a year earlier, though, the crew of Petronius was founded by some of the same members, and the, the crew of Petronius went on uh, to flourish, and it's still around today. It's the oldest gay carnival crew. We'll see more about them uh, in a moment. And several of the members of the crew Yuga formed other crews, uh, but they all have fond memories of Yuga. Here's a quote from John Henry Bogey, who was one of the founders, who says, the Yuga Regina was one of the most spectacular sights I've ever seen in my life. When the lights reflected off her royal raiments, the room was filled with explosions and bursts of light like fireworks. Who would have guessed that her children would take up the mantle of carnival and run with it like they were possessed? It was uh, apparently quite a sight. And here we have a slide indicating the original members of Yuga and some of the other gay carnival crews that they would go on to found. Uh, I mentioned uh, Petronius. Uh, you'll see the name Carlos Rodriguez there. Carlos Rodriguez was uh, actually the queen of Petronius at the time of the raided Yuga Ball, who jumped out of a window and climbed a tree to escape arrest. And uh, according to a story told by um, Albert Carey, who was later involved with Armenius, uh, he was hiding until the police spotlight shone up in the trees and uh, the, uh, the diamonds in his tiara and the sequins on his gown gave him away. And so poor Carlos was arrested along with all those other men. But these gentlemen founded Petronius. 
Uh, a couple of others founded the crew of Amun Ra, which is still around today. Uh, Arminius was founded uh, by Tracy Hendricks and others. Tracy Hendricks was the only member of Yuga that was part of the, that group. Uh, Jojo Landry went on to found the crew of Ganymede, which was very short-lived, but very influential. And then Bill Woolley <clears throat> and a few others founded the crew of Celestial Knights, uh, which is no longer around. But these are the crews that the original members of Yuga founded. And so I call them the children of Yuga. And these are the crews that I'd like to focus on uh, in the presentation today. Now, I would be remiss not to point out that there were a lot of other crews. Uh, here you see a slide indicating the 18 uh, major uh, gay carnival crews that have existed. Uh, we're going to talk about, we talked about Yuga, we'll talk about Petronius, Amra, Devine, Arminius. Uh, there was also Apollo, uh, which went away in 86 and was recently resurrected. Uh, Olympus, Memphis, uh, Ishtar was there, was also Polyphemus, which uh, only lasted about a decade. Uh, by this point, the AIDS epidemic was really doing a number on the community. And the crew founder and captain of Polyphemus, Gary Martin, who's still a bartender in the French Quarter today, just didn't have it in him to go on any further. He lost so many people to, uh, to the HIV and AIDS epidemic. Uh, the Lords of Leather was founded in 1984. They are still around. They do a fantastic ball, <clears throat> one of the best each year. Uh, the Radical Fairies do their Bridget Ball. The crew of M Window is significant. It's the only first African American crew, uh, and then you see the others. Uh, so, my, while we're going to focus on a few of the crews, uh, I want to make sure you understand that there have been a lot of other major crews as well as uh, smaller organizations that celebrate Carnival. So, Petronius uh, is the Grand Dame today. Founded in 1961. Here you see an invitation for their 62 ball. And here are a couple of posters. <clears throat> Some of you may know Henri Schindler, uh, who designed this 2002 poster for the Crypt of Cronius. That poster drawing is actually based on an actual photo of Elmo Ave in costume. Uh, the 71 sketch is uh, a poster by uh, the famed French Quarter artist, George Thoreau, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Now, you, if you've never been to a gay carnival ball, uh, I need to point out that they're a little different than traditional carnival balls. They, uh, they do have a grand march like the mainstream uh, balls do, but they, they're really more of show productions. And the captain of the crew selects a theme for each year's ball. And throughout the night, as the evening unfolds, uh, various members come out in costume, which are variations on that theme. And so the theme of the 1965 Petronius uh, Ball was the Wicked Bitches of History uh, in 1965. And here you see, standing on the stage, is the Captain Brad Lysham as Mae West, uh, and, but seated is the returning queen from the previous year, uh, Bill McKenzie. And that year, that evening, Bill Woolley was named uh, Queen Four. In 1968, the Petronius ball theme was Shangri-La. By that point, Bill Woolley was captain. Uh, queen was Millard Wilson. King was Clyde Webb. But it was Elmo Ave who was pictured here in the yellow dress as Scarlett O'Hara that stole the show. And Elmo Ave is uh, a very, very important figure uh, as far as the pioneers of gay carnival. And he was very involved in a number of uh, crews. Another very significant captain in the early years of gay carnival was uh, Jamie Greenleaf, who is pictured here. He was captain of the 1969 uh, Petronius Ball, the glorification of the American girl, a theme that was inspired by the 1929 Ziegfeld Follies movie of the same name. Uh, Greenleaf and his partner uh, had designed all the costumes for Rex's 100th anniversary, uh, a little indication that many of these men who were involved in gay carnival were also very inextricably linked with straight carnival as well. And um, Greenleaf also designed the Camelot poster for the crew of Olympus 
which uh, were short-lived but very influential. And their Camelot Ball is considered one of the classics of gay carnival. So 1970, uh, they went with a space theme. If you remember, we had just done the moonwalk in uh, 1969. So they did 2069, a space odyssey, or oddity rather. And here you have uh, Round of Brilliance from Saturn and Frosted Flower and Jupiter. <clears throat> if you look in the background of these photos, you'll see that there's a lot of space and they're not super, uh, they're not elaborately decorated with a lot of set designs. That would change later. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe these were probably held, these balls in the 60s and 70s were held at the International Longshoremen's Union Hall on Claiborne Avenue. There was also a, a Black Labor Union Hall on Chapatulas that hosted a number of uh, gay carnival balls. So the spaces where these balls were held was also a very interesting topic, uh, perhaps for a future year. Uh, the crew of Amun Ra was founded in 1966. As you can tell, it has an Egyptian theme. And here are a couple of uh, invitations. We've seen Tracy Hendricks' name before on the ill-fated 1962 Yuga Ball invitation. Here he is uh, in, for the 1968 uh, crew of Amon Ra Ball. And there is the, uh, the poster for a different ball in 71. Here are a couple more posters. Uh, always been an Egyptian theme, Amun Ra being the uh, supreme deity in Egyptian mythology. Here you have a couple of costume designs by John Zarang, who is still very active in the carnival scene uh, today. And these scenes, these uh, costume sketches were done for uh, Amun Ra's 50th anniversary. And uh, King and Queen uh, Darwin Reed and uh, his husband, Mike Morrow, wore these costumes at the 50th anniversary uh, ball. Here's another costume sketch by Chet Bush from the 83 Amon Ra Ball called That's Entertainment. And uh, here is Don. Uh, this is the costume that was worn by Don Toller as the ringmaster. Another crew that uh, doesn't get a whole lot of attention, even among gay uh, historians and circles, is the crew of Danny Mead, which uh, lasted from 1968 to 1974. It was a very influential uh, crew. Uh, here we have the 19, a photo from the 1970 ball, which was seen creepy crawlers. And this is Captain Nick Donovan dressed as a cobra, if you can, you can tell that. Uh, Donovan, Will, George Wilson, and Lou Bernard, uh, and others, would eventually form the crew of Olympus. Um, and another member of Ganymede, Wendell Stepulkovich, uh, co-founded the crew uh, of Arminius. But really, the driving force behind uh, Ganymede was uh, a man named uh, Vincent Indovina. Here is a quote from Howard P. Smith who wrote a book called Unveiling the Muse, which is the definitive book on the history of gay carnival. I highly recommend it. But on Ganymede's influence, Smith writes, Ganymede was the first gay crew to rework and expand the bow mask complete. Vincent Indovina, Rivet Hetterell, and Nick Donovan were visionaries who anticipated the theatrical presentations that would go well beyond the traditional grand march and parade of costumes. The ideas they pioneered reemerged in successor crews and particularly resonated with William Woolley and his mystic crew of celestial knights. Wendell Stipulkovich took the expertise and creative fire he developed at Ganymede and went on to form the crew of Arminius. The crew of Olympias formed in 1970 by former members of Ganymede forever changed the landscape of gay carnival with the extraordinary and groundbreaking Camelot Ball in 1971. Here is a, an image from the 1969 Arminius Ball. Uh, Arminius was uh, one of those early crews that is still around. They do a fantastic job each year. 
uh, founded by Wendell Stipulkovich, Jerry Loner, Scott Morvant, and Don Stratton. And here is Don Stratton pictured as Cherry's Jubilee, who was the queen in 1970. The theme of this ball was Armenius Gardens, which was inspired by the restaurant Harmonia Garden in the film Hello, Dolly. Um, and I should point out that in 2018, for Armenius's 50th anniversary, Albert Carey uh, and Wendell Stipulkovich, who were both still around, were named King and Queen, but were unable to attend uh, for a variety of reasons. But they are still around, and Carey serves as the, or at least he used to serve as the historian for the crew. Here is another poster from 1984. And here is a, uh, an idea of what you would have seen at an Armenius ball in 1980. The theme was movies, greatest moments. And so the costumes were taken from the films that are listed there. Uh, some are obvious, The Wizard of Oz, very predominant film in the uh, folklore of gay culture, uh, anti-mame as well. So a lot of the balls have taken inspiration from films. So one crew that is no longer with us is the crew of Celestial Knights. And uh, if you look at the, I've highlighted or underlined the first letter of each of those four words. Uh, this was William Woolley's uh, creation. Uh, crew of Celestial Knights or Cock. Um, the king and queen uh, of the first ball were William Crotty and Danny Jones pictured here on the left. And on the right, you have a, George Roth, Queen uh, Celeste uh, from 1985. George is still around. He lives in the French Quarter and is a pleasure to see walking around. He lives on Burgundy Street. Here's a quote from William Crotty. Bill Woolley designed each and every costume, and I sewed them all myself. Talk about numb fingers. The decorations and trimmings were done by the other members of the club, a total of only eight people. Needless to say, we had to expand the membership by having guest roles for that first year. Jones and Willie supplied the sets as they both headed display departments in major department stores. And that is, again, from um, Howard Smith's Unveiling the News. Um, so I think... That little survey of the early gay crews illustrates how much time and effort and energy and creative resources went into producing these balls. Um, another phenomenon of gay carnival that, that I should talk about before we wrap up is the Bourbon Street Awards, which was founded in 1964. And the Bourbon Street Awards are basically a costume contest. They still do it every year on Mardi Gras Day. Uh, and in 1964, Arthur Jacobs, who was the owner of the Clover Grill, uh, needed to drum up business for his diner. And so he came up with this idea for a costume contest. And that's how the Bourbon Street Awards got started. And here we see some pictures. If I had to guess, I would say from the 60s and maybe 70s, although perhaps early 80s. Not really sure. And I would like to conclude my presentation with a photo from the 1971 Camelot Ball, which was produced by uh, the crew of Olympus. And here we have Olympus captain Jamie, Jamie Greenleaf as Merlin. And I was too young to attend this ball, but from the folks I know who have been to it, they all say it really captured the magic uh, and mystique of gay carnival. And so I thought it would be only appropriate to end our presentation with a portrait of Merlin. Uh, and I would wrap up also by saying that gay carnival is still very much alive and well today. It reached its nadir in the early 90s and the AIDS epidemic really took its toll, but it has bounced back. Uh, there are currently 10 active crews, depending on how you count. Uh, of course, definitions of, of sexual orientation have changed, and the crews are a lot different now. I don't know what the future holds for them. Uh, I think, if anything, the presentation gives you an idea that 
It takes a lot of time, dedication, energy, money uh, to produce these balls. And uh, unless the crews uh, recruit young people, they will eventually fade away. But uh, from what I have observed, it seems like they're doing just fine uh, for now. So with that, I will thank you very much for joining me uh, on a little exploration of early gay carnival in New Orleans.